Hi, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lisa Haller. And I'm Jason Anderson, and Lisa and I are the programmers for the shortcut section here at the Toronto International Film Festival, and we're very uh, happy for you to join us uh, for one of our two sessions uh, with filmmakers from Shortcuts Program Number Two. And uh, we're really uh, excited about the films and the filmmakers, and we'd first of all love for the filmmakers themselves to introduce themselves and uh, and just uh, say which which film they're here to present. Hi, my name is Sofia Bogdanovich, and I am the director of the film Point and Line to Plane. Hello, my name is Roman Hodel, and my film is called The Game. Hello, my name is Vincent Toy, uh, based in Montreal, and my film is Aniksha. Hello, my name is Francisco Canton, and I am one of the directors of Loose Fish. Hey, my name is Pato Martinez. I'm the other director uh, from Le Swish. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here today to talk about your films. Um, they're each so different and so amazing, and we would love to hear how, um, how things began. Why did you choose to make these films, Was there, and what were the inspirations behind them? Um, well, for my film, Point in Line to Plane, um, the inspiration really um, was the passing of my close friend, uh, Giacomo Grisanzio, who was my first um, producer and collaborator when I first started making films. It was a year where I was experiencing a lot of death, unfortunately. Um, my neighbor, Jan, who I was also very close to, uh, passed away. Um, and I kind of went through this phase of trying to find um, meeting um, in all of it. And um, I read uh, this wonderful book um, called The Year of Magical Thinking, um, written by uh, Joan Didion. And it describes this phenomenon of um, how when someone passes away and it, it um, grabs its origins from Sigmund Freud, uh, that your brain just like can't um, handle it. Um, you're really having trouble trying to, I guess, like grasp at understanding that kind of like sudden loss and in trying to continue the relationship with that person, you kind of look for signs and meaning to kind of rationalize um, it all to yourself. So after the passing of these two really important people in my life, I started seeing signs and coincidences in my day to day and kind of wove this tapestry of um, I guess, messages that I felt like I was receiving, which became the film that you saw today. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. So my interest in uh, referees was uh, in the beginning, um, I just wondered about that guy on, on the pitch um, because I'm not a, a, a football fan, but um, I still know that um, about the players, we know everything, like I mean, every little detail, but about the referee, you know, uh, nothing. So, which is on purpose, of course, to protect themselves from um, the fans and um, the players. Um, so I started just to get in contact with different referees and I found out that apparently never someone asked them if it is allowed to record sound on a soccer field. I mean, there were films before in which they uh, recorded the sound of the radio chatter between assistants and referees, but never with a professional microphone where you can hear uh, um, the players talking to the referee and the referee talking to the player. And this as a documentary concept, I found really interesting um, because it, it looked like a, a, a secret in football, the, what people were talking on the field. Because if you're in a stadium or at home, you never see them, or you, you see them talking, but not hear them. So, and at the end, then I found this amazing protagonist and without him, I think I would never ever made this movie. Yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, yep, yeah, so uh, my film, just to give a little bit of context, is uh, it's set in Mauritius, which is a small island in the 
Indian Ocean. Right now, it's quite, it's been on the news quite a lot because of the oil spill that happened there. Uh, so in Mauritius, there's a booming industry right now, which is the uh, call centers. And I really wanted to make a film in the call centers because it's a place where young Mauritian go to work, emancipate themselves, earn, uh, emancipate, uh, uh, get a bigger network. And it's also in a special place because it's this uh, modern world that everyone has, aspires to. But Mauritius is also very traditional in, in many ways, very religious. Uh, uh, there's different religion. There's uh, Christian, Hinduism, uh, Islam, all mixed together. And on the other side, there's this secular AC uh, <laughs> office chair um, uh, place. One option so, is strategy oops. on recent sorry. Cameron Amst. I'm sorry. Do you want that one? No. It's, <laughs> sorry, Siri thought I was talking to her. So um, there's those two uh, directions. There's the traditional one and the uh, more modern place. And I really want to put a character in there and trying to figure out how to find a place in, this, in these two oppositional forces. Wonderful. Thank you. And then Luce Fish, please. Um, um, so I'm going to start for Luce Fish. Um, the idea to make this film arose from actually traveling to Morocco, to Esawira, to it's a fisherman's town in like two hours away from Marrakesh. And, um, and yeah, we basically like made some observations there and were sort of like really inspired by the, the dynamics between the people in the ports, in the harbor. And we took pictures and then like from seeing those pictures and sort of like analyzing and talking about them, um, it happened that we, we had this idea about like um, jobs or professions that are passed from one generation to the other and how like sort of being in a determined place uh, at the time, like being born at place and time like and in a particular family like could sort of like set uh, your future sort of like occupation and then we started like discussing an idea for a film uh, I think it's also like our desire to make a film was like played a really big role on this and uh, started talking about like a part like a particular scene a conversation between two characters that was like the initial sort of like shape and form of this film yeah, it was like this conversation between this kid and what would be sort of an older version of himself that wanted to pass like this sort of wisdom to him, but he didn't want to listen to it or he didn't want to have it. And once he comes of age, he takes his decision to to leave this place. Um, but yeah, w um, we got some problems. We we had to stay longer because our equipment and everything got stuck. So in the in the problem of staying longer we decided to actually create more more of a short film and that's that's where we ended up great thanks very much i mean it's fascinating i think one thing i think is striking about these films is they're all i mean they're obviously also different but also the processes behind each film feel quite different and i'm sure there's some connective tissue as well but i'd love to hear from um vincent and the loose fish team in particular since those are the kind of maybe most recognizably narrative films although those two are I'm, I'm sure are quite hybrid forms as well but uh, to talk about the process and finding that balance between you know a prepared you know a script a sort of idea where you want something to go and and also being very open about you know what improvisation or just following a story or characters or a place that and then following it wherever it's going to go and maybe uh, Vincent wants to talk about that first with, with the Niksha. Yeah so the the film was shot in April 2019 and everything was done through uh, Skype. Uh, the crew and the casting was done through Skype, which might seem very normal these days, but <laughs> at that time it was quite uh, awkward to talk to people from different places uh, in the world. And we, then we, uh, we brought a very talented crew of uh, Canadian uh, Quebecois uh, to go and, and film there and mixed 
uh, the crew uh, from Mauritius and the team from uh, Quebec and try to really create an environment where everyone uh, has an equal say in the process. Uh, and uh, then we started to make the film with uh, Aniksha, who's uh, Nishi Biari. She did uh, a few films before in Mauritius. It's a burgeoning industry there, uh, but not a lot of uh, film stats. It's mostly like TV series and they shoot some soap operas for South Africa in Mauritius. So, um, so she, I think she embodied very well that complex character stuck into the world and trying to find her own voice within it and working with Laurent Lucas, who's from here, also a French actor. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, mix of putting people together. Uh, beside that, there was also uh, the whole call center itself. It was a mix of actors and people working from the call center with whom we've been working with. And it was, it was quite strange to choreograph a whole a uh, team of people remotely from Canada. Uh, uh, Andrea Pena is the choreographer who helped us create the movement in, for the film. Uh, there's two dancers in the film. And uh, we made a small video, sent, sent it over, and they started practicing, I guess, in their spare time in the call center uh, during their lunch. And uh, everything came together quite miraculously. <laughs> so that was... Uh, that was a really good experience. And it is you were you were ahead of the curve in terms of your methodology there. Yes, yes, everything <laughs> remote. No one is seeing nobody <laughs> and trying to make it happen. Uh, great, thank you. And and same for loose fish. I mean, certainly this is a kind of a hybrid film of of uh, you know a lot of things that are close to documentary, but also in the form of a story. Um, so I, I was wondering about that, how you created that balance. Um. I think it it was like there was no way we could uh, make this film without making the actual like real characters uh, of of the story. I mean, perform. Um, I don't think we would have been able to get the same sort of like result uh, with an actor. So this was like the first challenge. I think. No, I'm lying. Like we had like many many difficult like <laughs> many different logistic challenges. Um, but this was one of them. And, and yeah, we were casting in, in the harbor and trying to see like who was responding better to directions and uh, who was like more inspiring for us, for us. So I think it was like casting in this case was really a big part of the creative process that, that really actually was sort of like um, inspiring the, the very script. You know, we took like parts of like who this kid was and sort of like used it to to create the scenes as well. Great, thank you. And was it, uh, I guess, just to follow up with Francisco too, is it, I mean, was there, um, were there sort of surprises as you went along? I mean, part where, you know, kind of the real world is sort of intruded and, and sort of changed your plans as you went along? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, surely. I mean, first we we gravitated more towards the the kids that were like that liked the camera more and that interacted with us a little bit more and we chose one of these kids to to work with and actually the morning we were we were ready to to shoot and he didn't show up and we waited for three hours and luckily this other kid which ended up being like our lead um was around and he was quite uh, far away from what we wanted from our our main character. And in the end, as Pato said, the way in which he moved and the way in which he lived informed the, the kind of scenes um, and, and content that we sort of shot with him. Incredible, thank you. Yeah, and there, there was like this really sort of like iconic moment where I think sort of like reality intruded into the scene that was like in the, in the end, and there's a scene where the kid like needs to jumpstart uh, a motorcycle. And the idea is that he wasn't like really, like it wasn't easy for him to do it. And instead of like, tr tr like communicating this to him, we just 
had him like sort of like try to start it and we knew it was going to be difficult for him so sort of like the situation for him for him was like really really sort of like real because he basically thought okay i need to get this done because i'm like ruining the the scene right now you know so he was like really eager to to make it work and i think in that moment we sort of like got a little bit of a perfect mix between reality and the and the, um and the, yeah the story yeah, Sophia, you might have had a little bit of a similar experience because you mentioned how many coincidence, coincidences intersected while you were making the film. And I guess that it could have formed the foundation of the short film in many ways for you. Um, was that the same thing that happened um, in terms of your interest in the interplay between art and expressions of grief? Um, can you talk about, you know, if the coincidences led you to that as well, or if this was something that you've always kind of played in your head as an idea? Yeah, I know that's a really uh, great question because um, I feel like it's very much a film that happened to me. I feel like I was very much, I think, um, a conduit. And it's a very strange story in terms of the process because I started shooting the film actually before, um, my friend passed away, um, but I didn't know what was going to happen. So I was in New York City and I was at um, the Guggenheim and I wanted to see the Hilma Off Clint exhibition, um, but I showed up on the wrong day and I wasn't allowed in. Um, but they said that I could, you know, watch everyone, um, the team installing the exhibition. And I thought it was really, really interesting. And something inside of me told me, you should film this. This is really, really important. So I pulled out my iPhone and I started shooting it. Um, and I went back to the exhibition the next day um, when it was installed and I was looking at it. And I started taking photos of these Venn diagrams of these orbs intersecting. And I sent the photos to a friend of mine, um, Rachel, who had helped me shoot these canvas strips that belong to my neighbor Jan, which you saw in um, the film. And I said, this really reminds me of Jan's work. Um, now, five days later after this, Jan passes away all of a sudden. He was already sick, but he passed very suddenly because he um, got an infection and he passed away. Um, and then 10 days later after that, um, my friend Jack passed away while I was in um, Vienna. And there um, I encountered seeing these Mozart balls um, all around me while I was at the Viennale trying to present um, a film there and kind of navigating that. And I was in so much pain and so much shock um, that this had happened, that I was like, there has to be a reason for this. So my brain was trying to rationalize it. Um, and it wasn't until I went to um, Jack's funeral where his sister um, said very eloquently in her eulogy that um, people will, will forget what you did, they will forget what you said, but they'll never um, forget how you made them feel. And I started thinking about Kandinsky's paintings because that was a mutual interest um, that Jack and I um, had. And I realized that Hilma of Klint was a predecessor to Kandinsky. She was actually making non-objective art um, before um, he was. And then I also realized that Jack was in New York City at the same time that I was and that he passed away on Hilma of Klint's birthday. Um, so all of these little signs just started popping up. So it very much started with me just starting to shoot things because it felt right and then drawing these coincidences together. And I remember sitting down one day and having accumulated and amassed all of these things. I wrote a big letter to um, my grandmother and the film just kind of poured out of me. Um, and I continued to shoot. I went to Russia on a research trip the next year. And by coincidence, um, Kandinsky is from Russia. So this, this kind of search and quest continued and I started to find more meaning, um, I guess, that connected everything together. Um, and from there, the last stage was to restage all of these moments um, with actor Derek Campbell, who you see um, in the film. So the film is very much something that was like amassed first and then kind of massaged together afterwards, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, I think that's such an incredible thing that you said that the film happens to you. Like it just poured out of you out of all these coincidences. It's fascinating. Um, and you really get to experience that through these restagings, through your um, intimate um, working relationship and I'm sure friendship with, with the actress, Dara. So um, yeah, thank you for kind of giving us that, that background um, on the film. It makes it even more beautiful. Oh, thank you. I was working a lot with Bill Hoffman at York University while I was doing um, my MFA. This is my thesis film from York. Um, and he very much is like a big supporter of letting the film show you what it is instead of making it fit into this box. So I didn't actually know what the form would be until I got to the very end. Great, thank you. And I guess I was thinking about, I mean, um, one of the delights of, of watching the game is just really seeing all of these different perspectives and all these spaces and, um, everything it's it's just kind of like almost like an exploded diagram of a sports event somehow and i guess i'm curious to, to hear from roman about just about that all that sort of challenge of just kind of kind of creating this sort of uh, like uh, reinventing this sort of sports event and kind of the um the process of, of of again finding kind of ways to be very prepared i'm sure you have to be very prepared to make a film like this but also being open to accidents and things that just kind of just unfold in front of you um, can you repeat uh, the final question? Sure. Like, I guess just the same sort of thing. Like, what's the balance between like being very, very knowing what you're after in a film like this and, and knowing what kinds of things you want to capture versus being able to capture the, the spontaneous things? Well, I guess we, um, it was important to me to have a, a concept in which all the protagonists were able to move uh, freely in space. Um, this was only possible, like you said, to, to um, intensive, really intensive uh, planning. Um, we had uh, up to 15 people at the end in the stadium and eight cameras and a lot of running around, camera there, camera there. So at the end, um, I think our protagonist was there, whatever he was, there was always already camera there. And he never had to be interrupted by a camera and there's also no moving camera except for the one um, which follows him into the stadium. And also with his father and with the final scene with his father in the car, the camera was already there. So there was never a moment where I had to interrupt him and say, oh, one second, uh, we need to start recording or we need to put a mic on you. This was all done before. And then two hours before, the, the game and after it was just shooting and there was always a camera there. I think that's how you were able to capture some of the magic in your film, especially that last conversation between father and son. Um, it just, everything kind of aligned and your access to the players and the ref and the, the backstage and everything that goes on is just incredible. So, um, yeah, it just gives you this amazing viewpoint into the sport. And for anyone that's itching for sport right now, I think it's, it's such an amazing view to see. And the same for, for Roman. I just was curious about your own kind of, you know, what your nerves were like during this experience, knowing you kind of built all this, this apparatus to sort of capture this game and capture all these perspectives at once. But, I mean, were you knowing that, I mean, did you have a sort of, second try as a backup plan? I mean, what was the kind of, I mean, how did you sort of create that? that in, I mean, what, in what kind of state were you in? Uh, we had budget for four shooting days, um, four shooting days with him on the field and with the whole team. Um, but for the last, we only did three because for the last one, we said, okay, we need to put everything on one card because the, the first stadium didn't work. Um, we did a lot of mistakes. We uh, a lot of things didn't work out technically and also in other ways. And then we had to move to a different stadium uh, because of political reasons, because they didn't want us there. And we had to start from the beginning. So we had 
we lost half a year, I guess, just to go to a different stadium, talk with all the people again, tell them what we do, tell them what the short film is, tell them what's the difference, <laughs> why we need this freedom, why it's important for us to go weeks before the actual shooting into the uh, dressing room of the referee to just plan <laughs> the, the camera movements. Uh, yeah. Um, and now I, I lost, uh, I lost, uh, oh. I lost it. Where, where? Your, tr your train of thought. Sorry? Oh, I just, uh, are you, uh, no, that's, I think that is, um, I think I'm just amazed that it happened. <laughs> that's my reaction is like, wow, you pulled it off because it sounds like an incredible uh, feat of logistics. Ah, yeah, yeah. And then, I know we said this is the, the final day. We will put everything onto this day. Uh, the last shooting day, uh, the, the crew exploded from 8 to 16. We, we, in the beginning, we shot with sport camera lenses and then we flew in cameras. And <laughs> I was, we were all very nervous, but we had so much to do that in the end, I'm so lucky that it was a good game and there was a goal. And sometimes I thought, oh, if there is no goal, ah, that would be bad for the movie. So, but everything was fine. Two yellow cards, action, and his father reacted. They, uh, two, day two, they had a really nice um, conversations at the end, which, which is also a gift. I didn't know that. And I was surprised when I yeah, saw it. Great, that's great. Thank you. Um, I think we just, I, I think we have time for, uh, for just, I mean, one thing I'm, it's, it's funny, we, when we talk to filmmakers about the films as they're sort of put together, it's, it's, it's amazing to think about themes that come up and, and, and coincidence. I think there's definitely a sort of level of, 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 of serendipity and, and really kind of being su surprised by things that happen in the course of making a film and making a story. And I guess, if um, there was anything else um, the filmmakers uh, want to talk about, what they, what they learned from this experience, like what surprised them about the course of, of, of making these films? Maybe start with, uh, with Vincent. Um, well, one thing is the mixing the crews, I think was something that was uh, a learning process for me. Uh, how, because it's uh, Mauritius, they speak French and Creole uh, and Canadian, French Canadian, they speak French obviously, but it's uh, mixing them together, having all of them in a, in a it's, it's hierarchical making a, a film, but also everyone having an important role and feeling that they're contributing to the whole process. I think that was crucial to making this film possible. Uh, especially coming from the outside. I'm Mauritian, so I have the ability of juggling between two worlds, but for the, for, for the Canadian crew, it was, it was uh, at times difficult to uh, make the, the translation. So uh, I have, to, I have the, uh, my producer, Guillaume Colin, to thank because he was uh, the solid rock behind the whole thing, behind the whole organization. So, uh, my hat to Guillaume. Great, thank you. And uh, and maybe talk to, to Loose Fish again, and this is another film that may have seemed like an improbable experience at some times and an impossible one, but sort of what did you feel like you learned through it? Um, we talked about like, there's there's many things I think we, we obviously learned about it, but in terms of like filmmaking, I think the biggest learning process of the film was the editing. Um, because we shot so much and um, there are many things, many scenes and images and like shots that didn't make it to the final cut that we really, really loved, but they were just not sort of like making the film better in any way or, you know, or the story more clear or nothing. Like they were not contributing to the actual film. And I think this was the, one of the first times that we experienced that sort of like situation of like sort of putting the the film before the 
the the shots i think like the the actual sort of like ex- experience of watching the film uh well you know what i mean <laughs> yeah and and not only shots but also um as as special moments that really portray and define the personality of our main character like we at some point we decided to leave out something that at some point we thought was like the maybe part of the core of it um uh, something that showed a more whimsical sort of laid back and 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 bright side of the of the main character we ended up sort of leaving out uh, for the sake of whatever reason we thought we had to at the moment and yeah that was a uh, painful but but sort of like a learning process yeah, it's amazing to consider that just because you know from my perspective and lisa's perspective the film is it's all there like everything it's it's an absolutely sort of cohesive you know it doesn't feel like a, a, a anything missing but i mean of course that's from good. an artist's perspective it's always very different <laughs> that's and, relieving to hear yeah you know, good and Sophia, same. Like this is, I'm sure, a very, a, a very personal, very emotional experience for you. But I mean, what, what kind of have been some of the things you sort of learned through this process? Well, I think one thing that I haven't spoken about is, um, I think, how this film is about um, being in an extraordinary amount of pain, so much so that you experience time in a non-linear way. And I really have to tip my hat to Dara Campbell, who I've been working with um, for a number of years, who's a dear friend of mine, who was able to really, I think, jump around in time and really embody um, that experience. Obviously, she's a a person that's very um, close to me. So she was with me when I was going through a lot of these movements. But as we were shooting, you know, I was saying to her, like, okay, now, now you're at the Guggenheim, now you're in St. Petersburg, now you're at the Hermitage. And she was able to calibrate this like palette of emotions and kind of transport herself there because we shot all of her scenes, um, my producer Calvin Thomas and I in about three days. And I was really, really impressed with her ability to hold so much emotion while also I think internalizing it but also really, I think, moving in between all of these emotional spaces, um, I guess like in her mind, but also um, trying to match herself with what was happening happening in the film physically. And I think for me, the biggest thing that I learned is that when you're shooting a film, if a disaster happens, it can actually be turned into a gift. Um, While I was in St. Petersburg, um, you know, I was having a really hard time shooting. I'm a woman, I was by myself, I was in Russia, um, and I was trying to shoot all this footage and I felt very nervous and uneasy because there's this law in Russia that if you shoot a government building, um, you can get arrested or fined for it. And there are all these like intricacies that I was hyper aware of while I was shooting because I was on my own in a place that I had never um, been in before. So I was nervous and I didn't load my Bolex properly. I was also grieving and in a very difficult state of mind. So that is why the film unlatched itself from the pressure plate. And for me, it was this big disaster. I was like, oh my gosh, it's going to look terrible. Like I went all the way to Russia and I won't be able to use this footage. But I think through really kind of being opening open to this circumstance and looking at it and saying like, what does the film want to be? How can I be open to these variables? And how can I incorporate this into the narrative? Made the film that much more interesting and that much more unique. Because I had this experience where I felt terrified to go out and shoot on the street at first. So I was shooting out of my apartment window and looking at the street. Um, And while I was doing that, while I was shooting, I think the inside of my bullocks was literally vibrating. And it wasn't until I came home and had this pressure plate tragedy that I found Kandinsky's book, Point in Line to Plane, and found all these really interesting passages about observing the street um, and not really being able to connect with people or to connect with your subject matter um, and vibrate with it and resonate with it until you're like actually there. So there were all of these very interesting, I think, coincidences um, that came out of this disaster that I was trying to kind of like ignore and stash away because it was a blemish 
that actually made the film that much more interesting um, and better. And it was a very, I think, scary thing to have to incorporate into the film. But I'm, I'm glad that I think that I got myself there um, eventually because it made the film, I think, what it is. Right, very much so. I think it's Roman too. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny to think about this sort of lesson of trusting in the universe in a year in which the universe has been dishing out all kinds of things that we don't necessarily want or need. But it is, I mean, it's, and that makes, I guess, the trust in the universe thing uh, all the more valuable. But yeah, I mean, Romans, what, I mean, what about your experience in, in making this film? It kind of connects with that. Well, I think for me, one thing in terms of my work, I would say I learned is to trust uh, in your characters to trust that if you put a camera in a room and hold it onto people that you will get rewarded even if you don't see it when you look at your material in the first place so and uh for personally i would say um i want to uh, i want to stay curious about things uh um that are not in my bubble or not in my world, that do not exist in my world, because it's, I think it's important that we are curious about things that we don't know. And Fedai, that, that's the name of my protagonist, that's the referee, he was always very interested in our work. He will also be in Venice and he is very interested in what we are what we were doing. And I was interested in his work and I think that's, uh a good good thing and it's important for humans <laughs> yeah great thank you and uh and lisa i think we uh yeah unfortunately i think that's all the time we have or maybe all <laughs> yeah. the time but thank you so much uh for all of your insight on your films uh, it's so wonderful to be able to chat about them and thank you um for tuning in for everyone who's tuning in as well um, we were so happy that you could join us. So thank you so much and everyone take care. Thanks again Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.